We will continue now straight away with um, our short talk session. And our first speaker is Alex Trapp from Badin Bladyshev's group. Fantastic. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to start off by thanking the organizers, uh, Morten, Daniela, and Alex, for putting together this really terrific conference. This is actually my first ever conference in person, so it's really an honor to be here and to get a chance to speak to you about some of my work. So as uh, Daniela said, my name is Alex Trapp. I'm a research assistant. I'm 22 years old at Vadim Vladyshev's lab. And today I want to tell you about a story that began just a few months ago and that has now evolved into two separate projects. Um, the first. I want to describe to you the development and the application of what we, of what to our knowledge is the first single cell epigenetic clock. And then in the second part, I'll tell you about how extensions of this framework can be used uh, to drastically reduce the cost of conventional bulk epigenetic uh, age profiling. So um, as Alex just uh, nicely introduced in the previous session, uh, methylation clocks are obviously very useful biomarkers for aging, but every single one that's been built so far has been built on bulk samples. And this means thousands or millions of cells combined together. Um, and this gives you a very um, heterogeneous look at the aging process. And really, you're only looking at the average methylation across many cells when you assess methylation in a bulk sample. And as Anne Brunet said in her talk on, uh, on Wednesday, I believe, uh, it's really important to get a, a good view of the single cell uh, aging trajectories and not just at the bulk level because really cells age and not just tissues. Um, of course, there's a problem with doing this uh, and uh, that's why it hasn't been done before and it's a huge challenge in the, in the modality of the data. So this is uh, most easily explained with this graphic that I'm going to show you here. And so when you have bulk samples, you're going to start with a lot of DNA. And that means that you're going to get very high coverage of different CPG sites uh, across samples. And then within a single sample, you'll have uh, very high coverage of also of a single CPG site. So that enables you to build these really beautiful uh, matrices here where you have CPGs that are covered consistently across samples. And the values that you see are fractional methylation values, a proportion of methylation across many cells ranging from 0 to 1. Uh, and this can be used very easily for machine learning uh, or deep learning, as Alex just mentioned in his talk. But with single cell data, since you're starting with much less DNA, about six picograms in a typical human cell, um, and most of that is actually degraded during the process of bisulfite sequencing, what we end up with is having very few reads, and they map very discordantly to different parts of the genome in different cells. So in cell A, you might have uh, this left CPG that is covered, and in cell B, it's going to be only the right one. And so this leads to a very sparse matrix filled mostly with missing values. About 95% of the values are missing. And the remainder of the values are zeros or ones, uh, binary values, which makes translating conventional epigenetic clocks built on the type of data that you see on the right side uh, inapplicable to single cell data. So to get around this issue, uh, we introduced earlier this year in March uh, the SCH framework, which I developed um, just a few months ago. Uh, there's a very early version of this on BioArchive, and it's now been updated uh, quite considerably. And I'm happy to report that the paper is impressed in a top journal. And uh, this is really a flexible and scalable statistical framework, very different from the way clocks are con conventionally built, and that enables for the first time epigenetic age profiling at single cell resolution. Uh, importantly, this doesn't require any imputation of missing states, and it doesn't require embedding into lower dimensional space. So for the end user, it's really a very accessible framework uh, to use. Now, I'll very briefly describe to you how it works. Uh, you can read more about it if you're interested. But the idea is that we use these nice, dense matrices that I showed you from bulk data in order to train regression models for a variety of CPGs, practically anywhere from a few hundred thousand to a few million. And uh, here we map how methylation changes as a function of age in each of these CPGs. And then once we have these, we intersect these sparse single cell profiles with this reference data set. And we pick only the CPGs that are common between the reference and the single cell. Um, that this outputs quite a few CPGs, many of which are fairly uninformative for the aging process. So we uh, put them through another algorithm that ranks and selects them based on how correlated the uh, 
the, the methylation at that CPG is in bulk data, and this enables us to get much smaller uh, binary matrices for each single cell of really age-associated CPG sites. Once we have this, uh, the crux of the algorithm is this probability computation step where we take the bulk model and based on the binary methylation value of the single cell, uh, we're able to give, us, give you a probability of how likely it is that that single cell came from a tissue of a particular age. So in this case, methylation increases with age, so you would expect to pick more methylated single cells at an older age than at a younger age. And that's really basically um, the way it works. Now we harness this over a variety of CPGs, all age associated, as I, should, as I said before. Um, and then that enables us to build these really beautiful uh, Gaussian likelihood distributions uh, where we can quantify the epigenetic age of a single cell using maximum likelihood estimation. Again, very different from classical elastic net methods. Now you're probably wondering if this works because this is totally a new approach. So we validated our approach on uh, differentiated cells. In this case, it was a data set from Jan Wieck's lab who gave a great talk yesterday. Um, and they took hepatocytes from four-month-old and 26-month-old animals. Um, and to our delight, when we train our model on liver tissue, we're able to get extremely strong predictive metrics for each single cell, despite the fact that these profiles are, again, very sparse and binary. And the error here is just about two months, which rivals uh, conventional bulk epigenetic clocks, if not even better. Uh, interestingly, if we train our model based on an equal distribution of six different tissues, so this is like a multi-tissue approach if you want to think about it that way, uh, we get slightly lower accuracy, still very strong. Um, so this suggests that really our method is, is quite powerful. Uh, in the same data set, they actually had some embryonic fibroblasts that they used as controls in their study. So in our case, when we applied our clocks to these data, we see a significant reduction in epigenetic age compared to the four-month-old hepatocytes, and all of these really cluster around zero, which is what we would expect given the embryonic nature of these cells. Um, so obviously this is super, um, this is quite useful uh, for common cell types like hepatocytes or even cultured cells, but really what we're interested in is these rare populations that really couldn't be assessed before with bulk profiles. And so in this case, we used uh, some really great data from the lab of Wolf Reich. Uh, where they looked at muscle stem cells from young and old animals. And in their original study, they used a pseudo-bulk approach, which they, means that they grouped all the single cells together. Um, and what they saw was that the chronological and epigenetic age of young muscle stem cells was pretty coherent, but the epigenetic age of old muscle stem cells was drastically lower than what we would expect based on chronological age. And so naturally, we applied our method to this. Or, yeah, so they, they saw attenuated epigenetic aging in muscle stem cells. So naturally, we applied our method uh, to these data, and we see essentially the same. So a significant increase between young to old, uh, but uh, the same idea that the, the old muscle stem cells don't show the same uh, epigenetic age as their chronological age. So we're able to confirm this, uh, this observation from Wolfreich. Okay, now I want to show you the most exciting single cell data that we have. So I want to echo a little bit what Vadim said during his talk. Uh, we recently have a paper published in Science Advances uh, regarding this rejuvenation period during early embryogenesis and the idea of a ground zero uh, that resets biological age for each, each generation. And so when we saw this data, we naturally asked the question of whether it was able, we were able to track this at single cell resolution. Uh, and the answer is yes. So we used a really wonderful data set again from Wolf Reich in Cambridge, a nature paper published two years ago, where they looked at individual embryonic cells from embryonic day 4.5 to 7.5. And when we apply our method to these data, we see a really beautiful reduction in biological age um, that culminates with an epigenetic age of zero uh, at embryonic day 7.5. Now, interestingly, there's uh, some interesting methylation dynamics during this period as well. So we have a huge rise um, in global methylation during this period. It's a de novo methylation event, uh, which is preceded by a, de a potent demethylation of the genome. And so our current model is that this demethylation followed by remethylation uh, is, is associated with this decrease in epigenetic age. Uh, now, this is... And this is directly to answer Morton's question to Vadim's talk. So obviously we have the single cell approach and we can look at these individual cells, but can we tell how different lineages age at different rates? 
Um, so the study that we used, again, from Wolfreich is really wonderful because they looked at three different modalities in the same single cell, DNA methylation, gene expression, and chromatin accessibility, and using gene expression data and a really beautiful atlas of embryogenesis published by some fantastic groups at Cambridge, we're able to map uh, each individual cell to a lineage. And what we see, three, three things that I want to show you. The first is that cell is that mapped to the epiblast across these four developmental stages, uh, really account for most of the rejuvenation signal that we observe. Uh, the second is that the newly formed germ layers, so we're talking endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, they show this rejuvenated signature, an epigenetic age of approximately zero, but some uh, lineages do not show this rejuvenation, and these are primarily extra embryonic and supportive um, lineages. So we, we suggest that this rejuvenation event is stratified, which really was not able to be seen before uh, in bulk approaches. So I think I'm almost out of time, but I just want to show you two more slides um, that really highlight something that may be even more powerful than the single cell approach that we developed. So I showed you before that deep sequencing, which generates uh, this, type of, uh, this type of sequencing, uh, is, gives you these nice tables. You can do machine learning on it, fantastic. But the problem is that it's super expensive, anywhere from two to $500 per sample, which is prohibitive for large-scale trials like clinical trials. Uh, but we thought that maybe we could leverage shallow sequencing, which uh, still using bulk samples here, not single cells, but really you arrive at a very similar modality of these sparse tables filled mostly with missing values and then uh, by a few binary values here and there. And the advantage of this, of course, is that you can reduce sequencing costs by many orders of magnitude. So we started with uh, deep sequencing data, uh, usually it's sequenced to a depth of at least 10 million reads, which is again, super expensive. Uh, and we had a pretty lofty goal to begin with. Uh, we were wondering whether it could be, uh, we could do a thousand fold reduction in the sequencing, that sequencing depth needed. So could we get predictions from only 10,000 reads per sample? Uh, again, thousand fold reduction, which would be wonderful, and it would be super cheap. Now, we don't know the exact cost at the moment, but we hypothesize that instead of two to five hundred dollars, we could bring it down to one to two dollar per sample sequencing cost. And what we see is really wonderful data, really remarkable. Um, and so we see a fantastic correlation of uh, 0 0.9, an error of only about three and a half months. And we see that we can accurately predict age in control samples, shown in blue here. Uh, and that we can uh, validate the intervention, in this case, caloric restriction, and the points shown in orange, which show a very attenuated epigenetic aging trajectory. Now, we validated this in an independent cohort, uh, again, with fantastic metrics and an error of under two months. And we can also highlight uh, IPSC rejuvenation uh, significantly compared to kidney fibroblasts from which they were made. So overall, um, I, wanna sh I just want to summarize. So we've introduced a method that enables dissection of individual epigenetic aging trajectories at the single cell level, which will hopefully allow us to find cells that age more or less uh, fast than others. And then maybe even more importantly, uh, this method and extensions of this method can be used to drastically reduce the cost of current bulk epigenetic clock or current bulk epigenetic age predictions. Um, so this would enable really large scale population scale studies. And with that, I want to thank you all for listening, both in Copenhagen and virtually as well. Um, this is my Twitter handle if you want to reach out to me, as well as my email and that of, of Vadim. Uh, we're very interested in collaborating with other academic labs, as well as biotech industries, regarding these two new uh, really nice developments. So please reach out to me if you're interested. Uh, this is our lab. I want to thank everyone there for the wonderfully supportive environment that I've experienced. And uh, special thanks as well to Vadim and Chaba, who are co-authors on my paper. And then our really wonderful collaborators, David Sinclair, and a, and a phenomenal graduate student in his lab, Patrick Griffin, uh, who have been uh, instrumental in some of, our, um, some of our discussions as well. And uh, our funding agency too, the NIA. Thank you. Um, do we have a question in the audience here? Yeah. Nice, very nice talk. Thank you for sharing this data. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have a question. Your model, the part on the DNA methylation data, is based on the probability of an increase in methylation with aging. Correct. Is that or, actually 
So it's not necessarily an increase, it can be both. So we map individual CPG sites, so some are known to increase, some are known to decrease, okay. and we just map so on Okay, so it's a, not necessary the increase. Correct, yeah. Okay. That was just what I showed to exemplify. And last quick point, you show all the data about DNA methylation. Did you have very nice clock also with ataxic and transcriptomic data? So we're working on those as well, uh, and Brunet showed some really great uh, work on uh, transcriptomic clocks in the brain. Uh, but we have also people working on that as well. And then attack is uh, attack seek is obviously a very interesting thing to do as well. Okay. And, yeah. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, and maybe you. you can go on Slack to reply Definitely. to the other questions. Thank you. Thanks.